a real pleasure to be here, and it's an honor to be here with Sam, a dear friend um, who's recently scaled and recently IPO'd um, Funding Circle, about a $1.7 billion IPO, for those of you who are not familiar with the company. Um, and we thought we would spend 10, 15 minutes just chatting about that journey, what that looked like. Um, I'll let you introduce yourself so I don't butcher it. No, no, well, I think you, you all uh, did the, the intro really well, and, and thank you for having me here, Noor. It's, uh, it, it really is an honor. Um, as Noor mentioned, I, I spent the last seven years through, uh, through April of last year building up the U.S. business for Funding Circle, uh, which ultimately went public in, uh, in October. Um, and so, you know, all the way from literally dining room table to uh, um, the, the London Stock Exchange, it was a, a really incredible journey. And uh, more recently, actually, I started another company in uh, financial services, which proves I must be completely insane because uh, building financial services companies is, uh, can, can be quite painful, but uh, it, it's also a lot of fun along the way. Well, you've done it once to an incredible success mm -hmm. story. I'm sure the, the next one will be just as good. In the meantime, I would love, and I think the audience would really love to hear about the investor journey. Mm -hmm. So working and walk, walking a very fine line between raising money, raising enough money, raising the right money. How do you think about that in terms of building a success story in your space? For sure. So um, what I would say is, first off, I think the very best companies um, only raise money when they, when they actually need it, when there's a good use of you know, wait, um, basically using that capital to accelerate their, their journey. Um, my experience as an angel investor is far too often I talk to entrepreneurs and they, they seem to focus on the raising of the money as being the thing that would make them successful. And in my experience, re the reality is what makes you successful is building a really good product, figuring out the go to market, and building an amazing team that's gonna be effective at, uh, at, at scaling your company. Money is, is you know, lifeblood at various moments, but honestly, revenue is the best way to get money into your company. Um, at Funding Circle, we, we did, we raised $373 million in, in private capital before we ended up taking the company public, and that was in part just because we had to build out all the various aspects of the, the company's infrastructure. Um, you know, a lending company is a complex, um, you know, it's a very complex business, and so we had to invest heavily uh, to, to actually be effective in that. I think for many companies, you, you, you can actually get away with raising a lot less capital, and specifically around inflection points um, in the business. And, by doing that, you actually can take a lot of risk off the table because I think if you, you once you raise money, there's this effective indigestion. It's around how do you how do you actually spend it? Um, and I've certainly seen businesses uh, go sideways because of that. So raise money when you need it and focus on growing the revenues and the company rather than the raising of the money, which mm -hmm. is where most entrepreneurs spend their time. Did you find when you were raising and when you were being the entrepreneur versus sometimes you're the investor? different things seem to matter to you. And now that you're the investor, those things seem so irrelevant. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would say is I think, again, I see, I've seen this as an entrepreneur, having done it a couple times, also as an investor. Um, entrepreneurs oftentimes get hung up on brand name of investor, headline valuation, and certain governance terms that in my experience, ultimately, those three things very rarely are what dictate the success of the company. So what I would say is raise money from people you want to do business with and you trust and who you think you can add value to the company. Certainly valuation matters, but ultimately it's much better to own a smaller percent of something that's successful than not be successful. Um, and so optimizing for headline valuation, particularly if that forces you into a situation where you're raising money from the wrong people or where because you're, you're trying to optimize for valuation, you, you end up having other terms in the deal that uh, end up being very painful, um, I, I think that would be the, the, the wrong way to go about it. And so, I mean, we've known each other for a while. You're a very nice and friendly guy. Are there any investors you didn't I get pretend. along with? <laughs> you pretend well. Um, are there any investors you didn't get along with? Um, any kind of stories or anything that you would say, you know, beware of in general to this audience as you go through the fundraising? Sure. I, I think it's, so what I would say is I, at, during the funding circle journey, we are very lucky to have some really wonderful world-class investors and board members. Certainly, there are always disagreements along the way around how quickly to grow, how quickly to make investments, when to raise, when to think about you know, taking the company public. Those are, I think, just adult business conversations. I wouldn't frame any of those as being serious disagreements. Um, I would say, though, that you know, we were careful also about who we brought into our cap table at various points, and there certainly were some folks where we went pretty far down the path and then realized, gosh, this is, this is not going to be the right, the, the, the right person uh, to, to be involved with the company. Because the reality is it takes, you know, on average seven to ten years to actually go from, you know, forming a company to having any potential of liquidity in it. And so particularly if the folks you're bringing in early, these are people who you are going to be, you know, glued at the hip with for quite some time. And so being really thoughtful about who those folks are is, is, uh, is pretty critical. 
So I want to pick up on something you just said um, on boards. Mm -hmm. How do you think about structuring a board? What's the right time for a startup to put a board together? Um, and how do you think about who you select for those boards? Definitely. So, so in my experience, uh, venture boards typically have three types of folks on it. They have one or more founders. They typically have um, the investors, who obviously they are re representing their investment and helping govern the company. And then at some point, you go out and you, you find some independents. And in my experience, having independents um, on the board is really important because you can use that as a way, not only just to have a different perspective in the room, but also because that, that's a great way to get people with deep industry expertise in the domain of the company we were building really engaged. And certainly in, in the last company, what, what I'm doing now in, in, in insurance, finding people from in that business, banking and in this business insurance, who've kind of gone the mile really helped us save some time. And when things you know, didn't go so well, they could actually offer some perspective on that, having lived it themselves. And so when you think about that, I mean, in our part of the world and in my experience investing in our part of the world, every investor wants a board seat. So if you have five investors, that's five board seats. If you have 10 investors, suddenly your board blows up, mm -hmm. right? So how do you think about that? Do you feel that that's something that's important for an investor to have? Do you think it shouldn't be correlated? Maybe only one or two of your investors. How have you done that? Sure. Um, so I think of the board as being the room where you have really deep, oftentimes ch uh, challenging conversations. And honestly, it's very hard to have that if you're in a room with more than seven people. Um, and so it's not even just a question of who's on the board. It's also literally like who's allowed to come into the room for certain parts of, of, of the board conversation. Now, the reality is if you are in a company where you go through multiple rounds of financing with multiple different investors and the only way you can get them in is if they take a board seat, then you're just going to have to figure out the dynamic. Um, in my experience, thinking about how you actually refresh the board as the company moves through its life cycle so people who are there and helpful early aren't still there 10 years later when they're less helpful, um, is, a, is a really important thing, and it's something that ultimately the CEO needs to drive, right? The, the, the reality is the CEO, one of the CEO's jobs is to figure out how the board should work, working really closely with, uh, with the chairman, which in some cases is also the CEO. How do you compensate independent board members? So, so that's one where it actually depends a lot on the geography. Um, in, certain, in certain jurisdictions, in, in the UK, for an LLC listed company, for example, you need to be really careful about offering equity compensation because uh, you can't have any real or perceived conflict of interest. In the US, um, typically it's, it's equity. Um, and so offering someone some options along the way, thinking of them basically as a, a hired employee of the company um, is probably the, the, the best way to do it. But again, in certain, in certain parts of the world, you have to think about it a bit differently and perhaps uh, give cash compensation. So in my experience, we used to structure th three-year board terms just so I would never have to kick anyone off a board. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you do, or do you think that you know, board terms are indefinite, and as the company grows, you've had no problem asking people to leave? Sure, um, so that is an uncomfortable conversation when it comes. Um, I do think that structuring a specific term for independent board members makes a ton of sense, mm -hmm. right? Because again, the, they are providing a service to the company. Setting a fixed term to that is, a, I think, a, just a good way to make it um, kind of go naturally. The reality, I think, with investor board seats is, if as part of the investment round, an investor has the right to appoint a board member, or as through their ownership of a class of shares has a right to appoint a, uh, appoint a, a board member, you're just gonna have to live with that. Okay. So from massive IPO back to startup land, what were you thinking? <laughs> um, so that was one that I did a lot of soul searching on, and ultimately what I decided is I liked dealing with my own problems as opposed to other people's problems. And so the idea of going and, and working on another company that was already you know, had some maturity was a lot less attractive than uh, bu building something from the ground up. Um, I will say the first couple of months going from you know, being in a company with 1,200 people or so when, when I transitioned to now a company with eight people um, and obviously zero people when I, when I started it was very uncomfortable um, because you, know, you, you get used to having certain things happen and you, you get used to having some leverage and then you have to go back to the, the very early days where we were building all that from scratch. Um, but the good news is we've been able to do things reasonably quickly and I'm actually having a lot of fun right now. Eight, eight people is a really good size. So I, I know that you're in stealth mode, and I'm cognizant that you can't speak much, but what can you tell us about this new venture? Sure. Um, so we're, we're building a technology-enabled insurance uh, company. Um, our view on the insurance sector is um, it is one of the largest and, frankly, one of the clunkiest industries out there. And there are lots of opportunities to, uh, to, to make changes really in two areas, one of which is around the, the actual consumer experience, um, and we're doing something in, in commercial insurance. And then the other piece of it is actually developing novel insurance products 
um, using all of the data that are available um, uh, around uh, both people and, uh, and, and companies. And so we're, we're spending some time thinking about how we can build really good data pipes that uh, will not only build a, uh, give us a good distribution advantage, but can actually allow us to uh, right size insurance coverage and price insurance risk uh, really effectively. So uh, trying to keep it somewhat under wraps right now, but uh, we'll be making some more noise uh, uh, come Q3. So transforming another industry. One last question, um, and then I've been told that time's up. Um, what's the one key learning you would take from Funding Circle as you attempt to scale this business into hopefully an even bigger success story? Sure. Um, so I think the hardest thing about lending as a category is there are incredible incumbency advantages to players because they have brand, they have distribution, they have a lot of data. Oftentimes they have customers they're cross-selling lending products on. And so with the benefit of hindsight, and, and I'm certainly trying to apply this lesson to what I'm doing now in, in the new business, figure out distribution first. Right. My, my, my view, and I'm, I've spent 15 years doing financial services stuff, so I can't really speak too, too credibly about other industries, but I think certainly within financial services, unless you can articulate a clear advantage from a distribution, meaning how do you find your customers, and also a data perspective, then the chances you're going to build a really compelling company without having to spend a huge amount of money are, are pretty low. So it's really about distribution and data, figure that out first, and then scale in the other, the other parts of the business. Great. Well, thank you so much. I don't know if we have time for questions, but... Um... We really appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me here. Thank you. Thanks so much.